Well, welcome to Podgate's first online worship experience. We are so glad that you have joined us today. And we want to acknowledge that this is an extraordinary time that we are living through. That there are fears and there are things that are, we have questions, what if or what's next or what's going to happen. And if we're honest, we have a lot of scared folks. And so we want to bring some hope today. We want to remind you that God is in control, that God loves you, that God will not leave you. And those aren't just some trite sayings that we say to make ourselves feel good. Those are biblical truths that we can build our lives upon. And so this morning, we're going to have a worship service. Uh, Pastor Jim is going to give a, a very timely and appropriate message for us. We're going to have some times of prayer. We encourage you to join us. We're going to have some worship. And we invite you to sing with us. Uh, whether you're looking at a phone or a laptop or a TV screen, join with us, sing out loud. Maybe you want to kneel down or stand up, whatever, however you want to express your worship, we encourage you to express it. And, and we know that it can feel a little weird to sing along to a screen. I remember a number of years ago when Pastor Jim and I went to a conference. The conference was actually in Chicago, but the conference that we went to was live streamed in Houston. And so we went, and there was a screen, and we were watching these leaders, and a worship leader said, okay, now would you stand with us and join us in song, and let's praise our God. And it was uncomfortable to worship to a, a band on a screen a thousand miles away. But I realized in that moment that God is still worthy of our worship, whether the band is live or right in front of me or a thousand miles away. That God is still worthy of our worship, whether I'm comfortable or not. And so, let's engage, let's worship our great God. Would you join me in prayer? Dear Lord Jesus, we acknowledge that you are good, and that you are great, and that you are worthy of all of our worship. Lord, so we give you our worship this morning. And as we lift you up in praise, would you bless us with your presence? It's in your holy name that we pray.
to read to you from Psalm 27. It says, The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is a stronghold of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? When evil men advance against me and slander me, when my enemies and my foes attack me, they will stumble and fall. And though an army besiege me, my heart will not fear. The war break out against me. Even then, I will be confident. One thing I ask of the Lord, and this is what I seek, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, and gaze upon the beauty of the Lord, to seek Him in His temple. Wait for the Lord, be strong, take heart, and wait for the Lord.
is nothing too big for you. And so, Lord, no matter where we may find ourselves, in this moment, would you speak to us? Would you take away those walls that prevent us from hearing your voice? And Lord, then when we, when we hear from you, when you speak to us, would you give us the courage and the faith to respond in obedience? To not do things the same way and be the same old people, but to be people that are completely in love with you. To be people that trust you. To be people that are known as friends of God. And we love you, we love you, we love you. And it's in the mighty name of Jesus that we pray. Amen. Have you ever noticed that the thirstier you are, the better it tastes and the more satisfying the drink? Whether you've been running, working out, the thirstier you are, the, more it the better it tastes, the more satisfying. I had a friend who just got out of the hospital recently after surgery. She couldn't have a drink of water for a week. And she said that that first drink was pretty awesome. It was better, it was the best tasting water God had ever made. We're made to thirst. We are. The human body is two-thirds water, and the, how much water you have in your body and in your system determines the vitality and the strength and the health of your body in every way. If you lose just 2% of your water supply, your energy will decrease by 20%. If you lose 10%, your energy will be decreased so much you won't be able to walk. If you lose 20%, you'll be dead. We all thirst. God made us that way. The question is, what are you thirsting for? Because whatever you're thirsting for will define your life. What have you been thirsting for these last few days? Maybe the sports to go back on TV, maybe some of your trips to be back on, maybe the restaurants to open again, or lots of toilet paper on the shelf, crowds over 10 people, normal things on Facebook, right? Like puppies and kittens and all kinds of food. Maybe you're thirsting for school to start again. Maybe not the kids, but the parents, right? Maybe you're thirsting for that stock market to go up 2,000 points instead of down. Maybe you're thirsting to go back to work. Maybe the bottom line is this. You're thirsting for normalcy. You want things to go back to normal, and someday, hopefully sooner rather than later, they will go back to normal. Normalcy will return. Then what? One thing that we all have right now is time that we usually don't have to think about the deeper things in life, the things that we really are thirsting for. Don't miss that opportunity, even if the opportunity came for reasons that you didn't want. Let's talk about those deep thirsts that you have right now. There's places in Scripture where it talks about the deep thirsts of our heart over and over again, but I want to show you too one from the book of Jeremiah and one from Psalms. Here's what Jeremiah says. My people have committed two sins. They've forsaken me, the spring of living water, and have dug their own cisterns, broken cisterns that can't hold water. Now what Jeremiah is saying is there, there was a great fresh water spring that was healthy and good, and that came from God, so to speak, and they rejected that. They dig their own way. They wanted to go their own way, do their own thing, and they rejected God, and instead they had a false thirst. Can't hold water. It's not going to get them anywhere. That false thirst is never going to satisfy them. But then there's a true thirst. Psalm 42 talks about that. As the deer pants for the streams of water, so my soul pants for you, my God. My soul thirsts for God, for the living God. So there's a true thirst that only God can satisfy, and indeed, he can satisfy it for all eternity. When you think about Jesus on the cross, he said seven words uh, before he died. We've looked at that over these last several weeks, and today we're going to look at another one when he's on the cross and says, I'm thirsty. Here's what it says in John chapter 19. Later, knowing that everything had been finished, 
And so that scripture would be fulfilled, Jesus said, I'm thirsty. The jar of wine vinegar was there, so they soaked it in a sponge, or soaked a sponge in it, put the sponge on a stalk of the hyssop plant, and lifted it to Jesus' lips. So Jesus was talking about physical thirst, obviously. That's, that's true. And when it says all is completed there, it's talking about all of the work that he did from the moment he was born until that moment where he's on the cross. All the teaching, all the miracles, all of the things that he did to show who he was and what he was about, and ultimately the fact that he's soon going to die for our sins once and for all. All of that is now accomplished. And with that in mind, Jesus from the cross says, I'm thirsty. That takes on a powerful new significance. There are four things I want you to notice about that. The first one is, right here, Jesus thirsted because he's, his life fulfilled prophecy from God's word. See, there's a thousand years before Jesus even arrived on the scene on earth. King David wrote Psalm 69. Psalm 69 is a prayer of David. He's crying out to God. He's being attacked by enemies. He's distraught. He's praying. He's hoping that God will show up. And he's just agonizing over all that's going on. And he desperately wants God to show up. And when it says that so the scripture might be fulfilled, it's saying that Jesus' life is no accident. Because David's words back some thousand years ago, ultimately, without David even fully realizing it, ultimately pointed to what Jesus was going to say on the cross. The fact that he was thirsty. The fact that there was going to be a wine vinegar drink there for him to drink. David talks about that in Psalm 69. Out of the blue. See, Jesus, everything that happened in his life, none of it was an accident. It was designed, divinely conceived before the foundation of the world. There were even, believe it or not, over 300 specific prophecies in the Old Testament that Jesus fulfilled, said who he was and what he was to do. They were written hundreds, even thousands of years before Jesus was born. How in the world could that happen? I mean, if, if somebody like knew those things like the back of their hand and decided that they were going to be born and just try to fake living all that out and sort of become the role that Jesus was going to do, is that even possible? A mathematician, a guy named Peter Stoner, tried to figure that out, and only a mathematician would do that. You know what he said the chances were of that happening? Here they are. One, to the ten, one in ten to the 17th power. That's a lot of zeros, right? I don't know how many gazillions that is. In other words, it's impossible for somebody to fake this. Only Jesus, by God's hand, could do this. His expert hand made all this possible. It's important to have an expert. A few years ago, my mailbox, the wood on the beam, the post, rotted and fell over, and I had to fix it. I had to go and dig out the old post. I had to dig a new hole. I had to put a new post in and set up a new mailbox. I'm not the most mechanically inclined guy in the world. In fact, you could say I'm on a deficit when it comes to mechanical stuff. So what did I do? I got out YouTube. And I watched a video on how to put a mailbox post in. And the guy described it step by step. Get the post and how to dig the hole and how to mix the concrete, the whole bit. He did it all. He said it would take 30 minutes. I got the post in. You can go to my house and see that it works. Didn't take me 30 minutes. It took me more like 90. That's what happens when you're not mechanically inclined. But you know, when it's a job like that, you really don't need an expert. But then, about last year, two years ago now, I had surgery on my back. When I was laying there in the prep area and the anesthesiologist came in and he said, okay, I want you to know that uh, the neurosurgeon's down the hall and he's watching a YouTube to learn how to do your surgery today. That was a whole different thing. Of course he was joking, but I don't think I want any neurosurgeon operating on my back watching a YouTube video. You don't want to watch a, have a pilot fly through a plane because they learned how to fly from a YouTube video. When it counts, when everything is on the line, you want an expert. Let me tell you some good news. You can rest secure that everything about your salvation, everything about your relationship with God was expertly crafted. You know, thanks to this coronavirus, nothing about your life may seem secure right now. Everything that we had planned, at least for the next, you know, future, seems upended, it seems out of control. You're not in control of your life and I'm not in control of mine. 
That may be true for us, but it's not true about God. God loved you enough to leave absolutely nothing to chance. He created everything in the heavens and the earth. He upholds the universe right now, believe it or not, by the word of his power. And there are so many wonderful promises for us in Scripture that talk about how we are secure in Him and His plan. Here's one of them in 2 Peter 1.3. It says this, His divine power has given us, which includes you, everything we need for a godly life through our knowledge of Him who called us by His own glory and goodness. Which means, more than anything else, everything Jesus ever said, Everything Jesus ever thought, everything Jesus ever did, including his thirst on the cross. Something that you would think may be completely insignificant. Everything he does matters. Everything he did matters. And when you thirst after Jesus, you're thirsting after something that is trustworthy and true. When everything else in the world is not, he is. Here's the second thing I think this passage teaches us. Jesus thirsted because... Well, he was human, just like us. If you've ever spent time with people as they're nearing the end of their life, you maybe go visit them in the hospital or maybe even their home, what you find is almost universally true, they thirst. They're thirsty. Even if they can't swallow anymore, their mouth, their throat is dry, and they crave just that wet sponge in their mouth to give them some kind of comfort. When Jesus is on the cross here, he's no doubt dehydrated and exhausted. If we were to read all of the passages that talk about his trial and his execution and all that went into that, you know that by this time he's endured all kinds of physical problems. He's, he's been beaten. He's carried a 100-pound cross till he collapsed. And he couldn't carry it anymore, and somebody had to finish. He's been nailed to that cross. He's been hanging there for some time. And every breath is agony as he goes up and down that cross to breathe. Everything. So no doubt, even he's going through all that, he's, he's thirsty. And he asks for something to drink. And it says that they offered him that wine vinegar, which really is most likely a drink that Roman soldiers had all the time. It's called posca. It was a, a mixture of wine vinegar and water. Why would they bother to do that? See, by now, the wine, the alcohol part of the wine vinegar is dissipated because if you're a soldier, you need to be alert, so they don't need the alcohol part. But they dissipated that the alcohol out, and now there's vinegar left, and it was a cheap drink. It tasted better than the water that was there, which probably wouldn't be very good and tasty. It killed the germs and the impurities, and so it was a favorite drink for a Roman soldier. It's kind of like the Gatorade of the ancient world. And here's Jesus. In his last moments from the cross, I'm thirsty. He's human. Now, getting him that drink is not going to save his life. It's not even going to prolong his life. But it will help him in the last moments of his life to clear his throat, to, to have those, the ability to say those last words that he's going to say. You know how important it is to have somebody in your life who gets the experiences you've gone through? You ever notice a, a mother, uh, how she connects with another mother about pregnancy, about caring for young kids, right? They immediately connect over that shared experience. Somebody who's gone through a health crisis, how they immediately connect. Somebody's been cancer, they've had this operation, they've taken this medicine, they connect. Somebody with an arthritis or a certain pain, they automatically connect with somebody else. You, you've seen combat veterans, right? They can't sort of connect with people like us who maybe have not seen combat, but boy, you get two of them together and they understand that experience. Even if they haven't been in the same battle in the same place, they connect on a level you and I can't appreciate. It's true for people who go through hard times, like maybe a divorce. Maybe they go through some type of a loss of a loved one, right? They connect over those experiences. People who have the same job connect. People who go to the same school connect. People who are in the same stage of life connect. It's naturally, they have this shared experience that they can connect on with absolutely no problem. Every one of us in the entire world right now can connect on a shared experience of what we're having to do to adapt to a new life with coronavirus 
whether it's about washing our hands, whether it's about how many times we touch our face, whether it's about the fact that certain things aren't open or we're restricted to our homes, or all of those kinds of things, right? We have this shared experience. When you know that you can connect with somebody because that experience is shared and they get it, there's something powerful there. Well, I have some really good news for you. Whatever you're going through, wherever you are, Jesus gets it. You see, he was fully human. And he experienced everything that you and I will ever experience, the good and the bad. If you read the Gospels, you know that Jesus experienced happiness and joy, and he experienced pain and sorrow. He knows sickness and health. He knows friendship and community. He knows loneliness and betrayal. He knows hunger and thirst, and he knows life and death. And when you thirst for Jesus, the real thing, you can know he understands you like no one else ever could. He gets it. He gets you. Here's the third piece. Jesus thirsted to suffer for us. To suffer for us. If you read the Gospels, you know that Jesus was not excited to go to the cross. Oh, he went willingly. He knew what was going to happen, and he went willingly. But, but he wasn't excited about it. There's a prayer that he prayed on the night before he was arrested. It's recorded in Luke 22. Here's what he says. Father, if you're willing, take this cup from me. And of course, he didn't mean a drink. He meant the suffering he was going to endure. Yet not my will, but your will be done. He knew it was coming, but in a very human moment. Jesus asks if, if there's any other way. If there's any other way, can it be taken away? And the answer he got was essentially, there is no other way. There's no other way that these people can be saved. There's no other way that this can work. If you don't go through this, they can't be taken care of. And with that, Jesus submitted to the Father's will. He drank, metaphorically, that cup of suffering. The cup of suffering that you and I deserved. He drank it so that we could drink the cup of joy that he deserved. You've heard the expression a lot of veterans use, never leave a man behind. It drives them to go and search for that wounded comrade or even the one who's laying dead on the field. They will not leave him behind. They'll do great sacrifices to go and find them. Or you've seen people sitting by the bedside of a loved one, a friend, a wife, uh, a loved one of any kind. They're sitting there, they hold their hand, they won't leave them. Somebody's always next to them. They don't want to abandon them. Well, that's just a picture of maybe of the wonderful news that we have with Jesus. Jesus didn't abandon us in the worst of his suffering on that cross. And if he didn't abandon us then, he will not abandon us in any suffering that you and I experience now. No matter what's going on, he'll be there. He didn't have to drink that cup of suffering, but he did so willingly. And because of that, you can trust that Jesus will be with you even when you suffer too. Now, don't misunderstand me. He doesn't promise to take it all away or to make it not happen. Here's what he promises. He will never leave us or forsake us. So when you thirst for Jesus, when we thirst for the truth of who he is, we can count on the fact that he'll be with us even in the worst of times. Here's the last thing I think this passage teaches us. Jesus thirsted, well, he thirsted to be poured out for us. There were two interactions in the Gospel of John earlier in this passage where Jesus has an interaction with one woman at another time of crowd where he talks about thirst. Here's the first one in John chapter 4. Everyone who drinks this water, he's talking to a woman who's all alone, who's very far from God by a well. Everyone who drinks this water will be thirsty again. That's the water in the well. But whoever drinks the water that I give them will never thirst. Indeed, the water I give them will become a spring of water welling up to eternal life. You know what he wants that woman to know? He's going to satisfy her thirst in a way that no one else ever can. We're not talking about physical thirst now. We're talking about the deep thirst of the heart that will really satisfy for all eternity. He wants them to know that. In another place, in John 7, he says this, this time to a crowd, talking about who he is and what he's about. Let anyone who is thirsty come to me and drink. 
Whoever believes in me, as scripture has said, rivers of living water will flow within them. He's talking about the transformation that's going to happen to us. See, here's Jesus on the cross crying out, I am thirsty. And he's not literally talking just about physical thirst. Here's what's happening. The living water, Jesus, he's thirsty on that cross. The ultimate source of grace and mercy and peace and love and hope is being extinguished at that moment. He's being poured out at that moment in every way. Ran across a story about a group of Spanish explorers, sailors, many centuries ago who sailed a sailing ship from Spain all the way to South America. By the time that they got to South America, their water supplies were exhausted. There were men that were on the verge of death from thirst. And they began to sail into the mouth of the Amazon River, which is the widest area of fresh water, a wonderful expanse. It's so huge in the mouth of the Amazon River that it appears, and it appeared to them, like it was the Atlantic Ocean. They were still in the ocean. As they're sailing up that river, nobody ever thought to check and see if that water was drinkable. They didn't test it. They didn't try. And some men... Well, they actually died of thirst while they were floating on the greatest source of fresh water in the entire world. Right now, you and I, all of us, we're thirsting for some kind of normalcy. Someday that's going to return. Then what? When that happens, when you go back to thirsting for those false thirsts that have defined your life up to this point, that ultimately never satisfy, you, you chase and chase and chase and, and they always seem out of reach, or when you finally catch them, they don't satisfy anyway. Or, will you begin thirsting for the true thirst, the thirst of Jesus that ultimately will satisfy you for all eternity. Now, as you're sitting at home, is a time to think about what's going on in those thirsts in your heart and really examine yourself it's a time to deal with those important questions. I have some great news. Jesus gave you everything that you could ever have and everything that you would ever need in him. You didn't deserve it. I didn't deserve it. But it's not about our merit. You didn't and you can't earn it. But the good news is it's not about our works. Jesus poured it all out for us. Nothing more needs to be done. You simply must receive him by grace alone and through faith alone and in Christ alone. And when you do that, your whole life from the inside out will change. And when you move from that place, what you'll find is you want to spend the rest of your life being a kind of person that drinks him in more and more every day. You want your whole life to be patterned after him. You want your whole life to be guided by him. You want your whole life to be sustained by him. You want your whole life to be defined by him in every way because you know with every sip, it's the best tasting, most satisfying drink you'll ever have. Would you pray with me? Jesus, we put everything in your hands. We invite you to have full and free control over our lives. We confess that we've thirsted over things that we shouldn't have thirsted over. We've thirsted over things that will not satisfy. We confess that we've been distracted by things that just really in the end don't matter. And here we are, God, with the normalcy of our life upended. And maybe we have some time and some space, some mental space, to begin asking ourselves questions that we've never asked before or at least not for a long time. We pray, God, right now that your Holy Spirit would speak to our hearts, that it would point out to us who you are and who we are, and that, Lord, we would want to thirst after you and after nothing else. Forgive us, Father, for the times we've thirsted after those false, false things, the, the sins that we've committed. Forgive us for that. Create in us a clean heart, O oh God. Renew a right spirit within us. Don't cast us away from your presence, but restore, or maybe even for the first time, 
Give us the joy of salvation in you. And Father, we pray that everything that we do going forward in this life is about drinking you in. Drinking you in with our families and having you to, to define everything that we're about in our homes. Drinking you in at work, Lord, and having you define the way we are as a boss or the way we are as an employee. Drinking you in in our social circles and having it to define how we treat people, how we talk to people, how we carry ourselves. Just drinking you in in every way. We ask this in your name and we thank you that you made it possible. In Jesus' name.
trust in you alone. We acknowledge, Lord, that we thirst after all kinds of things, for normalcy, for prestige, for power, for popularity, for all these things. But Jesus is the only one that can satisfy. We thank you that you went to that cruel cross so that we can have new life. We acknowledge that. We thank you for that. We praise you for that. And now, because of that, that new life that you have given us, we want to offer that to other people. We want to give this hope that we have to others as well, to others who are thirsting for you, and they may not even know it. Thank you for this time, Lord. We hope that you were very honored with what we did here. Be blessed. We love you so much, Lord. In Jesus' name. tuning in and worshiping with us this morning. We're so thankful to be a part of a church that can gather together regardless of where we are physically and lift up our voices to the Lord Jesus. You know, as a church team, we're working diligently to create creative ways that we can continue to connect with you throughout this COVID-19 pandemic. You can learn more about those on our, our website, but one way we want to particularly encourage you is through online giving. You see, during times of crisis, the church is often the first place that people will turn to. We expect that in the months ahead, we will see an increased need for us to be the hands and feet of Jesus in our community. We've made it very easy for you to give online or via text, and there's information about that uh, on the screen here. We also want to stop and encourage you this morning to go and be the light wherever it is that you are in these days. Obviously, there's a lot of dark stuff going on in our world, but we believe that we as the church have the opportunity to be the light in a brand new way throughout this COVID-19 pandemic. And so, although our physical church uh, may look a little bit differently right now, our mission remains the same. And we want to encourage you in this moment to love God like never before, to love people like never before, and to love now. We love you. Go and be the light.